Hey there. I'm Henry Strickland. Our speaker is Virgil Griffith. He's talking about Polyworld using evolution to design artificial intelligence. And having had to take artificial intelligence classes in, in college, I'd be very happy to let evolution do it instead of me debugging all those list programs they gave me. So um, Virgil, um, as a young lad, read a little too much of Douglas Hofstetter, and he therefore dedicated his life to cognitive science and causing trouble. Um, after uh, some undergraduate at University of Alabama, he went to Indiana, where he teamed up with Larry Yeager. Uh, some of the older Googlers might know Larry Yeager from Apple Computer. He had a project called Polyworld a long time ago, and it still lives on, and Virgil's been working on it and adding features and things to it. Virgil has done internships at the Santa Fe Institute and at the Keck Institute, and now is his first year as a grad student at Caltech. All right. I just do. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Virgil. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a first year grad student at Caltech. Um, you can reach me. That's my, that's my website. For those of you wondering, the, the .gr stands for Griffith. People get confused about that. I'm not Greek. Um, and that's my email address. So, um, so in short, yes, I'll be talking to you about uh, um, basically trying to use evolutionary algorithms as a shortcut to creating artificial intelligence. Simply because artificial intelligence is, well, hard. And uh, an evolution is fairly easy. Well, at least, well, it's easy to set up. And the, the, the hope is that, that us, uh, we can take advantage of having lots of the CPU cycles and we call evolution to do a lot of the designing for us. So that's, that's, that's kind of the, the general gist. And we'll, well, let's move on with it. So, there we go. So, um, so well, when I first get this, people always ask me, well, what is artificial life anyway? They just go, you know, this is ill-defined. Well, in short, uh, artificial, life is, is, uh, artificial life is sort of a superset of biology. So all biology is artificial life. But to be more precise, artificial life is all life as it is today, so as is in the circle, and it's all to what life potentially could be. So all these other possible evolutionary paths that, uh, the, that uh, evolution could have taken would also be in our artificial life. And we'll be exploring some of these areas because we'll be hoping to explore uh, um, AI, these outside ones. So, for, so, I always, so just to begin, let's talk about evolution real quick. So this is a brief intro evolution. Evolution's an algorithm. It's really straightforward, actually. Here's how it goes. You have a population, and, you ha and some things let stick around more than others. So, and, but some, yeah, that must, must be the case. Um, so, and that's your selection. And then you have these things, uh, they, they, there's, some, there's some heredity. And then you rinse, repeat. And regardless of substrate, you always get evolution with this. Very straightforward. You have a population of things. You, if you only have only one, then you have hill climbing. And that's, that's crap. But you have to have a bunch. And some reproduce more than others. Straightforward. And, and then there's heredity and we'll, we'll, with occasional errors. Done. That's all you got to do. So no matter, it's just, um, yeah, it's great. So got to get that on the table. So moving on, um, so I'm going to show you a, a nice, nice good example of using, using evolution to, to design um, body plans. So this is before we get to AI. And this was uh, not my work. This was by Carl Sims in 1994. It's really pretty, so I'm showing it to you. So basically in this case, uh, so what he's doing, he's using evolution to design bodies, design um, uh, body, body morphologies to do like different tasks in the world. In this case, the population is a, um, do I have a laser pointer or anything like that? I can just point. Well, anyway, okay. So the, uh, the, the population is, 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 a, is a whole, whole bunch of these uh, nodes and, and, and um, connections joining them. And you can mix and match nodes. So like, they say, hey, I'm going to put this lens segment over here and vice versa. And you can kind of see uh, kind of how, how they, how they make, these, make these morphologies, you know, about how, uh, you know, how this makes a tree and vice versa. It's actually kind of cute when you look at it. So they're actually worth understanding. So all right, sweet. OK. So in this case, the, uh, yeah, I just have the joints between parts. So yeah, so the population is a grass of nodes and edges, and the, and the selection is the ability to perform a certain task. So walking, jumping, something like that. And the, uh, and the mutation is, is basically the grafting nodes here and there. And we're just going to let it go and see what happens. And, and here we go. So, whoop. No. This demonstration shows trying virtual to. creatures that were evolved to perform specific tasks in simulated physical. Do, do, do. Nope. And 
and that one. All right, let's try it again. This demonstration shows virtual creatures that were evolved to perform specific tasks in simulated physical environments. Swimming speed was used to determine survival. Most of the creatures are results from independent evolutions. Some develop strategies. They are evolved. Multiple these creatures simulated together. Friction. Some simple solutions yeah, with just two parts were found. Some seemed like they could use some assistance, while others were fairly efficient, such as this rowing-like behavior. Here is an odd cousin of the previous. A mutation caused him to tumble. Some creatures evolved to incorporate contact sensors in their control systems. Here is another inchworm-like creature that tends to go in circles. This was actually a creature first evolved for its ability to swim in water, then later put on land and evolved further. A successful sidewinding ability resulted. Here is one with a hopping style. The protrusions on its arms seemed to help prevent it from tipping over. This was the fastest, with a successful galloping-like stride. This group was evolved for their jumping ability. This group was evolved for their ability to adaptively follow a red light source. The resulting creatures are now being interacted with. A user is moving the light source around as the creature behaves. This one seems to flail randomly, but somehow still manages to approach the light. Perhaps it is mean to move the goal away just as it arrives. Here is one that has propeller-like fins which are tilted depending on the direction of the light. It can adaptively swim up or down very well. So just to pause. This one's especially nice because it looks like something a human would design. It has that same kind of motor thing. And if it weren't for uh, this little part just hanging off here, you'd swear it was designed. And in this case, this is a case where uh, evolution has, has stumbled across um, you know, a very good design and it's extremely efficient and it looks you know, very much like something we would build ourselves. So, like, basically, seeing designs like this should, like, should come for us and say, yes, this, 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 can do, this can work. Sure, is there a question? You mean uh, the crawl sense work? Um, this work was recently redone uh, for the Artificial Life 10 conference. Um, I know they used it to evolve catapult designs. Um, so I don't, I don't know if they've actually recreated all of this. Um, but, but, but I do know at least large sections of this have been recreated. I know that for a fact because I worked in the lab. So, so that's, that's all I got. Um, I'd like to read this back. Thank okay. All right, now, so uh, what's the next one we got here? Oh, um, so I've seen this before where, the, where they're moving kind of, kind of, kind of weirdly, um, especially the one where, uh, where it just had like the, the big hanging mass. The sole fitness function in this case was just to, was just to move your center of mass forward or just, just move it, period. So in this case, like, like evolution is very, like it loves to cheat all the time to, to, to find some way to do this. So in this case, uh, what it was doing is it was just had this big long tentacle thing and it was just moving its tentacle thing around. Thus its, thus its uh, center of mass was moving. Um, so, so just another thing to keep in mind is that, is that if you ever have any sort um, you have to, when you design your evolution simulations, you have to always know all the weird ways it could cheat. And we'll get back to that later. So here's some more. This final group of creatures was evolved for their ability to compete for control of a green cube. The creature closest to the cube at the end of a simulation is the winner. Here, a strategy first arose for simply tumbling towards the cube. Then one learned to block out his opponent. But then later, one learned to overcome the obstacle by climbing over it. Some pinned down their opponents. Some covered the cube with protective arms. Others simply unfolded onto the cube. The success of a strategy is often highly dependent on the opponent. Here is a hockey playing creature which takes the cube away and wins by a large margin. Here are two similar hockey strategies battling it out with appropriate gestures. <laughs> 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 
This crab-like creature walks well, but often continues past the cube and instead seems to prefer beating up on his opponent. <laughs> Against the arm, the crab seems to simply walk away. A successful strategy is this two-arm technique that swipes quickly in from the side and moves the cube over to a second arm. These are the final rounds of competition amongst the overall best. Finally, the seeker arm goes against the side swiper, but the cube is just out of reach. Okay. So, this is a fun movie, movie I always, always like to show. Number one, it's pretty. Um, and the second is because uh, you know, designing body types, well, that's kind of hard. Like doing some of those solutions, you have to kind of think about them for a little bit. Now, this is not designing AI, but it does show how, how, like, how, how evolution can stumble across very inventive uh, solutions. And so this is meant to be like inspiring. Say, so, oh, you know, maybe we can do something else even better with this. So that's what we have next. So next is using artificial life to evolve artificial intelligence. So here's, uh, well, here's this idea. So the first question is, how do we do a population for, like, like what, what's, what thing do we mutate and tinker with to, for something to be intelligent? And there's been lots of answers to this question. So the marionettes said, the Greeks said marionettes. And um, so, yeah, so the, the, the strings, all, they're, all, they're all deeply connected. And this is clearly the way you think about intelligence. And then Descartes said it was hydraulic. So the mind is like, this, like the sewer system. You know, these little compartments here and there. You can find lots of pretty art from that time of all about it. And pulleys and gears, industrial revolution. Yeah, we've done this before. Telephone switchboard. Yeah, we, we've, heard, we've, we've heard, we've even heard some of these analogies. But um, then Boolean logic, yeah, that didn't go so well. But I'm pleased that we finally solved it. And the answer is not digital computers, but it's neural networks. Praise the Lord. So, um, so I guess, I mean, given the history, you should probably take neural networks as kind of a grain, a grain of salt. But, you know, there's really some reason to think, think neural networks are a reasonable way for, for representing intelligence. I mean, after all, um, we, we, we really are, like, we're modeling the brain much, much closer than, say, digital computers or Boolean logic. So, um, so, so even though there have been, been many attempts, it's like, what is the proper framework to, to capture intelligence? Um, you know, the, history is not really on our side. But um, I, st I still think there's, there's a good reason for it. So just, uh, just go with me on this one. So um, now, nervous systems. Now, say it's very nice is that if you look at the neuron, say a human neuron, like an individual one, um, versus, versus say, say, say some other mammalian creature, even reptiles, you often can't tell the difference between them. Um, it takes, takes like a real expert to do it. So like, at the, this, like an individual neuron level, we're all pretty much the same. It's, all in, it's mostly in the connections. And evolution, and it, like from us all the way down to like sea slugs, you, see, you still see nervous systems that are roughly the same. Um, so this is very nice because roughly this says, says hey, you know, if we could just get our basic model right, you know, uh, you know with, with, with a sea slug, it could perhaps ride this model all the way up to the top. Um, I mean, if evolution did it once, why couldn't it do it again? So, yeah. Um, so now we're talking about uh, sort of the way, so now we have our nervous system, the important parts about it. So in this, so in this case, we, we do, know that, do know that some behaviors are innate, so there must be, must be some things that, that are, that, that are um, inherited. We also know many things are learned. So, we, so, the, so the nervous systems must change within an organism's lifetime. This, just, this is just sort of basic principles, seems reasonable, we're going to go with that. So not too hard. And with all this in mind, I'm going to introduce you to you, Polyworld. Ta-da, this is the simulator. Not to be confused with Polyworld. Um, we, 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 we got a thread about this. So just so you know, this is not us. We're the other one. That's with two L's. We're with one. And we do, we do pre predate them, but not that it really matters. Okay, so what, what is Polyworld? Uh, Polyworld, is, Polyworld is an attempt to, well, so before, it's an attempt to evolve artificial intelligence the same way natural intelligence came about, which is, simply put, the evolution of neurosystems in a, in a complex, rich ecology, and they compete with one another. So, and we're, yeah, so the, so the hope is that uh, we, we begin with a model, something very simple, and then through competition and through making the world, world richer, it can, it can gradually, like, get better and better and better. Sure. Um, that's hard. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, uh, let's see. Well, how would you do that? 
I, I guess, in short, the, the, the answer would be, number one, uh, uh, we can play sort of a deistic creator, or even an intelligent designer, and we can, we can kind of help it along. And, and, the, and the hope is that, you know, we can say, oh, that's good, we want to, like, really help you. Um, and this is not something natural evolution ha had the benefit of. Um, and furthermore, um, Moore's Law is really nice. And so, so I agree with you, that is a problem. But, um, but both of those two, two factors help. But, uh, but it's, 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 it's a legitimate concern. Um, so yeah. So, and in short, um, but Power is, is, is it's a new software, it's open source. I'll give you the link at the end. And, uh, and you know, those are kind of, kind of the goals. But most recently, people have been using it for, uh, for doing behavioral ecology experiments and like, and like uh, with experiments with very simple neural networks. So if you're a scientist, you can use it for that too. Um, so now we know what Polywood is, to what Polywood is not. So Polywood is not fully open-ended. It's pretty much just designed to be a flat world. Well, I guess you, yeah, it's designed to be a flat world where, where, where critters interact. Um, it's not really an accurate model of really anything, um, but it could be done. Um, there's, I mean, it's, uh, there's, there's no real problem with it. The only, the only reason we haven't made an accurate model of especially anything is because it's computationally expensive, and we don't believe it's especially important. So, if, uh, so like right now, we're just using uh, a simple uh, summing and squashing neurons. If you wanted to, you could, like, you could uh, render it all the way down to the actual biochemistry, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, I'm personally not, um, but you know, you could. And if you're into ecology, you can do that too. So, um, so yeah, that's what I got. So moving on some more. So I'm telling you about a more. So here's basically what evolves in poly world. So um, organisms have evolving genes. They mate sexually, straightforward. Uh, they, they do have a body, but the most important thing about them is the neural network brains. Now, the connections in the, ne in the brains are genetic, but at birth, all of the weights are random. And, and, um, and Hebbian learning, which is the learning mechanism and, and, and the primary learning mechanism in the human brain, which is simply put, um, well, and that sets all the weights. And Hebbian learning, it's a very simple algorithm, works like this. If two neurons that are connected together fire at about the same time, the connection between them gets stronger. And then, so that's step one. And then step two is all connections decrease in, in strength slightly. So, and that's it. Um, and it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of surprising. It's kind of surprising that, that this one learning mechanism accounts for most of our intelligence. But you know, so it goes. Um, and, the, and their vision on the world is kind of uh, Edwin Abbott's Flatland. So they see a, 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 little, a little strip of pixels in front of them. And, and so basically, what it's evolving. Uh, it, it is evolving a neural network to take their one-dimensional vision uh, and turn it into behaviors that help them survive. So. Uh, and so just so you let you know, there's no cheating in any of this, um, as you often see in evolutionary simulations. Um, there is no fitness function. This is like pure natural selection. This is as raw as it gets. If something, like, like the only criterion is merely to survive any way you can. And this includes exploiting bugs in the code. And we'll show you an example of that. So, um, okay. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'll show you that in a second. So do, do, do. Okay, oh, wait. oh, go back. Okay, so here's a nice pretty picture of Polyworld. Here's how it goes. So, where is my thing? Here we go. So, uh, these brown things here are barriers. They can't cross those. These moving things here are the critters. And these green things here are food. So you see when a critter dies, they become food. Now, this is kind of an early st stage of the simulator, and so they aren't very smart. They like going along the edge a lot. But they get smarter, I promise. Um, so, so, it's, so, basically, merely existing in this world causes you to lose energy. And if, you, and, if you, and if your energy gets to zero, well, you, you cease to exist. So, so thus, like, for anything to stick around, it must go out and find food or go out and kill something. And, or, and it must like, mate with, with other organisms as well. If it doesn't, it's just not going to stick around very long. It's, 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 it's pure Darwinian. Um, so, and you can kind of see how it looks here. Uh, so here's the, uh, the top-down view. And each one of these little... Well, each of these little squares here you saw, this was the world rendered from one critter's perception, but it's uh, stretched out slightly for our convenience. But to know exactly what they see, they see the middle strip of pixels in that. So, okay, so that's Polyworld. Um, so now I'm explaining to you the, the, the genetic model, because I always get asked about that. You don't have to pay a lot of attention. This is mostly for reference, for those of you who are into this kind of thing. So these are, the, so, the, so um, as I said before, there are body genes, there are brain genes, and these are the body ones. So, and here's probably how it works. A critter can be big, but, but, but when it's big, uh, it, it doesn't move very fast, but it can hold more energy in it. So, you know, it's kind of a trade-off. And if a critter wants to be a predator, it can be really strong, um, so it can do that. And it can also determine its maximum lifespan. This, come, this, actually, this actually informed from the uh, evolutionary literature. It basically said that, uh, that it, it's good that, that we have, like, a, a hard limit that we can't, that, let's see, 
it's good that we have a hard limit that if you just eventually die of age, because even though it's extremely unlikely for something unfit to live a long time, it's so utterly bad if, if something unfit lives a long time and mates a lot, that you, that you want a really hard limit on, the, on, um, on, on how long you can live. So, and this is also kind of motivated, it's kind of for myself, uh, something we thought about. So like for example, um, you might want to, want to pop out tons of kids, but give them almost no energy. So, like, so the parent can decide how much energy they want to give them. Or you might want to have only a few kids and give them lots of your energy. So this is a, you know, whatever chart you want to use. Um, so we'll go back to the colors in a little bit. But um, yeah, so uh, the green, how green a particular critter is, is determined at birth. So you can have like the light green critters and dark green critters, stuff like that. Um, and also their mutation rate is also specified genetically. So yeah, no cost for points. Okay, genetic rate. Okay, so this is the exciting part. So this is the brain genes. This is, this is like 95% of the genome. So here's how it works. So the genetic model, it specifies which colors you want to pay attention to in your environment. So if you think red's really important in your environment, you can spend a lot of neurons to go see it. Um, yeah. It also has the number of internal groups. And these internal neural groups which work like this, and it depends on how they're connected. So the genetic model only specifies roughly how many connections are between each neural group. It does not specify at the pure neuron level. And this is motivated from biology. So if, so if you see, um, yeah, like, 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 well, it just is. Um, and it's not really worth getting into. Um, so for those of you who are, who are neural network buffs, you, you can read about all that. Um, but the, the main thing to take home from this is that the, the genes loosely specify, loosely specify the brain, and it does it at sort of the neural groups level. And that's really the main thing to take from this. So, so uh, to make this more clear, so here is how a, a typical brain looks. So you have one neural group here, you have excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. We, um, we distinct, many neural networks have the inhibitory neurons, excitatory neurons, they can, like, like a single neuron can have both excitatory and inhibitory connections. But when you do that, some biologist puts up their hand in the room and say, but brains don't work like that. And you say, well, fine. So, so, so there, for you biologists in the room, they're different, be, be happy. All right, so you have multiple of these things, and they can have different numbers of excitatory inhibit inhibitory nodes, and they connect to each other. So, straightforward and they connect back. It's nice. Um, and then you can have multiple neural groups, and they can all connect to each other however else they want. Now, these internal neural groups connect to some, some output neurons, or behavior neurons, and here they are. Now, these are the, these are the, uh, the seven behavior neurons, and they're defined in the, in the simulation. And in short, there are things like move forward, turn left, turn right, eat, mate, fight, um, blink, I'll show you that one in a second, and focus. So basically, uh, every critter has a little light in front of it that it can sort of, that it, that can, that it can um, blink with. The idea is they could do some sort of primitive sing signaling mechanism. As far as I know, they haven't, fully, they haven't taken advantage of this force signaling, but you know, you give them, give them room to grow. They obviously can't evolve to do it if you don't give it to them in the first place. So, it's in there. Um, and we also weren't sure what, what kind of eye they wanted. So this, so depending on the activity of this neuron, they can have sort of a fish eye lens, or they can have like, you know, really, really, really straight. So, and that's just simply because we weren't really sure what, what, what kind of eye they might want. So, you know, evolution can decide. Sure. Oh, no, this, this comes next. Oh, sorry, and these connect to one another. Okay, so here, so here are the inputs. Okay, so genetically, so if you want to pay attention, so this critter wants to pay attention a, a lot to green, a little bit to red, and not so much to blue. And so these are basically the inputs, and these inputs can connect to, uh, to any of these internal groups that they want. And it also has an energy level. So, so, so this tells you like, roughly uh, how healthy, the critter knows roughly how healthy it is. It also has, has just sort of a random firing. Just because, you know, might want it. This is, this is the free will of the critter. You could think of it like that. Um, and I'm surprised enough they actually use the random. You wouldn't really think so. But um, they like random. I'm not exactly sure why they like random. But, um, you know, but regardless, we put it in there to say they might, they might like it, and behold, they do. So, hmm? I'm sorry, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Are not feed-forward networks? Uh, these are not feed-forward networks. So, like, these internal groups can connect to each other however, however they want. So you give them a certain number of cycles for convergence? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we'll do with this later. So there's things between input units and processing units. Not that's important. Sure. Have you assigned energy costs to neurons? Yes. Um, and roughly, the, the reason we did that, huh? Repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. I was asked whether or not uh, there's there's an energy penalty for uh, for having a large number of neurons or for numbers or for neurons being activated. The answer is yes to both. the The problem was that if you didn't do this, they grew huge brains that like 99% did nothing. 
So you were just like, well, like computation is just silly. So if you're gonna have a big brain, it better will do something. So, so yes, they, they get a cost for having, for, uh, for just having a size, certain size brain or for neurons being activated. So like doing anything cost you something. Um, yeah, so good, good question because we didn't do that initially and we forget what happened. So um, this is, rough, this is uh, this roughly the same picture I showed you before and this is made, made, using, um, made, made using dot, it's really nice. Um, oh, sorry, graph is. So, and uh, this just shows you a polyorganic brain map saying, no, really, I'm not joshing you. This is how, this is how they work. And so these are, the, these are the inputs here. They connect to uh, excitatory, they connect to uh, excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. And these are sort of the, uh, the behavior neurons up here. So, you know, there's fight, turn, light, blink, et cetera. Um, so and it's, it's just, just kind of shows you what, what, what one of their brains uh, typically look like in a non, when they're not idealized. So that's all to get from that. So, okay, so um, uh, as far as a creature is concerned, everything's about, about uh, getting energy. So they get energy, well, they die, and that's bad. So uh, here's how they can get energy. They can eat food pellets, or they can eat other, other critters. Straightforward. And they lose, they lose energy by doing anything. Like, merely existing loses energy. So if they don't do one of these things, they're gone. Um, so, you know, and these, these, these especially, like mating costs energy, um, and being big and strong costs energy. And, uh, and just for, as in, just having a brain cost energy. So, mention that. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you some, uh, some, some, some behavioral samples of how, the, uh, of how the, the, the output neurons, well, basically what it looks like when they turn these things on. So here's eating, and it's gonna eat this neuron right here. And you see it slurps it up. Ta-da. So I'm gonna show you some more of these before you get to the emergent stuff. So what's gonna happen here is that, uh, is that uh, one critter, so okay, oh I'm sorry, I should mention this. The color of every critter is, is an RGB triplet. So the redder a critter is, at this, at, is, is how aggressive it is at this moment. The bluer a critter is, is how much it wants to mate with, mate with, just mate, at this moment. And the green is, is genetic, as specified before. Um, the, uh, the reason we decided this is because, well, you know, you want to have someone wants to kill you, and you want to have someone wants to mate with you. Very straightforward. Um, and for green, the idea is that you might want to do, do kin selection. So, like, for example, say, hey, I'm light green, I want to be nice to you because you're light green. Sure. Um, so it's, um, we've seen a few cases where they, have, where, they, where they have done some tribalism based on the green, but you usually have to kind of like trick it into doing it. Um, but it does happen. So well, basically the important thing is here is that these are both uh, kind of red, so they're gonna do battle. So let's watch this one. So here we go, it runs into it, and it gets eaten, and, he's, and, he, and it turned to a food pellet, and this one slurped up the body. So that's how eating works. Um, oh, in this case, um, so, so the, si the, the bigness of a critter is, is, proportional, is proportional to its strength. So basically, even though this critter was stronger, it just had like a lower amount of energy and it got beaten by the weaker one. Okay, so here's how mating works. So this critter's gonna come in here and mate with this one. And a little child will pop out. Okay, so now we see what happened here. Okay, so, so, so they made the child, but, but they were so, ex they, were so uh, they expended so much energy given the child, uh, they, they put so much of their energy into the child that they immediately died afterward and the, and the child ate their carcasses. <laughs> so here, we can, we, can, we can see that again for, for those of you with kids. <laughs> what, is it gonna, gonna load? Let's, let's do it, there we go. Nope. Okay, mating, let's see it again. Okay, so they come in, make the child, and they, and they both die, and the child doesn't really care. Slurp. Okay. Next we hear is lighting. So, so, so this is the blinky. Let's just show you this. And this critter's gonna come here and it's gonna blink at you. So here it comes in. Oh, I'm sorry, no, it turns its blinky off. So right now the blinky is on, because you see that's its normal color, and that's the blinky, and now it's turned it off. So, so they, they can shine uh, lights at each other. Okay. So now I'll show you some. I'll show you some of the emergent behaviors. So this is one of the. So uh, we call these things species, just because it's kind of natural. Technically, they can still mate with each other, but behaviorally, they're so different that uh, that it's, it seems reasonable to call them that. So these are joggers, and all they do, they just go forward all the time. Um, in this case, the world is 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 is, is, a, is a toroidal world, so you can't go off the edge. Um, we have other worlds where, where you can go off the edge, and they move in circles a lot. Um, so, but in this case, uh, usually the first thing you see in a simulation just always goes straight. It's very easy to code, and if food is, 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 is randomly distributed, why not? I mean, you know, you're, it's, it's, it's quick and simple. 
So that works. Okay, so this is a really nice one. I talked to you before about how evolution will take advantage of absolutely anything, like including your bugs. So this is a very nice bug. Now, uh, when this was, uh, this was initially done, um, it had not occurred to me that, uh, that having a child cost energy. You know, because you, know, you, you just do it, it's pretty easy. Um, so, you know, it's my male bias. But, uh, well, I'll show you what happens. Uh, when we did initially, initially there was no cost for having children. And here's what happens. So you'll see them, I think they're over there, and we'll zoom in in a little bit. So you see their own little cluster over there. And we're gonna zoom. There we go. Okay, so you see that, that they have this whole orgy going on here. And they are, and they are popping out kids. Like, like, like really quick, and then immediately eating them. <laughs> um, and with this, this is because, because eating, eating the children becomes a free source of energy. So you have two, so as far as the critters are concerned, you have two choices. You can go out and get food, or you can mate and have a piece of food appear right next to you. <laughs> the solution is clear. Um, and and this, was, this was like really boggling. It's like, why are they doing that? Because like, this would be immensely successful and would take over everything. And I could, took a while to figure that out. Um, but yeah, so we, now it cost, so now like, it costs energy to have kids, so now they don't eat them. It's not as, not as, not, not, not as prevalently. So, okay, so just, just to let you know that evolution will take advantage of your bugs. It's actually a really good way to test. So, okay, so moving on from the indolent cannibals. Um, okay, so now we're gonna show you some, uh, so now we're gonna show you some actually intelligent behavior, at least well, primitive intelligent behavior that has emerged from this. So, uh, this is just showing you that yes, this is actually doing something. All right. Okay, so we're gonna actually see them, actually, they actually use their vision. So a critter's gonna come by, and, this, and the critter lurched forward. And see that, okay, here, we'll, sh okay, there's some more of them. So yeah, so you see it jumped forward. So really all this is saying is that, hey, um, they actually are using their eyes for something, and they're using their eyes to control their behavior. Simple enough, not, not, not a very big claim. But it shows you that we're actually getting something right. Like keep in mind when these critters start, they have completely random brains. And I assure you, they're crap. They don't do that. So I'll, I'll show you some examples if you'd like. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna show you some more ones. Here's fleeing attack, or in short, running away from red things. So usually like the first thing, usually the first things the critters learn is number one, move. That helps to find food. Number two, move towards green things. Because green, because food is the only green things. Well, solely green things. And the other one's turn, get away, uh, turn towards blue things, because they want to mate with you, and get away from red things, because they want to kill you. So here's them wanting to get away from red things. So we see a red thing coming up here, and it's going to run away from it. And run away. So this is very nice. So they, they, and this came out completely naturally. Uh, no, 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 no supervision at all. Just, just, uh, just playing deistic creator and letting it go. So here's some more. So here's some foraging patterns. So uh, usually they, they, they like to kind of act out on their own, become a lone forager. But some of, sometimes they swarm. So you find like a whole bunch of very weak critters, and they mostly just go in, go in circles all the time. And they, and so like, um, so they say, hey, uh, like, say, say they'll be dark green. So they say, okay, I want to, turn, I want to follow dark green things, and I want to turn in circles a lot. And if you do that. Uh, the swarm just sort of gradually moves because the ones that are near food, they, they live, and so the swarm just kind of gradually moves towards the direction where food is. And, that's, and that works. It moves slowly, but it, it does work. Okay, well that's, let's see, I don't think there's anything more on this one. Oh, I was saying it's kind of fun. Um, you can see, actually you can kind of see them engaging in kind of purposeful behavior. Like you saw at the very beginning of the simulation, they mostly just kind of sat there. But you actually see them, they, you know, they were actually moving around, actually turning towards, turning towards green things, actually pr displaying kind of the, you know, pseudo purposeful behavior. So, that, so that's uh, steps in the right direction. All right, so here's just what we've seen so far. Um, first of all, they, 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 make, they make a lot of different kinds of brains. They're actually, they are using their eyes for something. That's good. And they're actually doing useful things with them. Also good. So, all right. Um, so, now I'll show you, show you, some, show you some, some more sciencey things. We've tried to look, try to analyze the behavior to determine if we're actually getting anywhere and trying to like quantify it. 
So this is a nice one from the, um, from the uh, animal foraging literature. So this is actually pretty straightforward. Here's what you do. You have, a, you have a world, you have a food patch on one end and a food patch on the other. And you say, okay, well, how are the creatures going to allocate themselves? So at the very beginning, they're kind of uniformly dispersed. Middle, it's like, oh, well, you know, some hang out in here, some hang out in there, some in no man's land. And then late, they go, oh, being in no man's land's bad. I don't want, I don't want to go there, so they hang out in the two food patches. So, um, so, the, so this, well, they, they, are, they are foraging. That's good and they're doing it correctly. And even better, if you actually look at, uh, they're actually following the optimal foraging pattern. So there's this distribution you commonly see in the foraging literature called the ideal free distribution. And lo and behold, they, they hit it perfectly. So, all right, good for the critters doing optimal foraging. Um, so now I'll show you some predator-prey cycles. These are kind of neat, so um, the colors don't come out that great, but it'll be okay. So in this case, we're looking at predator-prey cycles between the critters and the food. So in this case, the Red is the critters, and so this is for a particular food patch, the ones you saw before. Um, so the red is the number of critters in that food, is the percent of critters in that food patch, and the green is the percent of food in that food patch. So in short, what you see, let's pick, uh, say, this one here. Okay, so, we, so you see that the, that the critters lag the food. So first the food will go up high, and then shortly afterward the critters say, oh, I want to go in this food patch. And then they over-harvest it, and the food goes down. Then the critters leave and go to the other food patch. And then the food back goes up again, they move up and go back to the food patch, and this oscillates forever. Yes? In the previous slide, when you were showing the free agent distribution, there is no food growing in the middle. Correct. Is the food in this graph strictly other critters? The food in this patch? No. No, no. And in this case, this, this, case, this was, was two food patches close to each other, and they would just go back and forth between the two food patches, is what they would do, and depending on uh, where, the food, where more food was at that time. And, uh, and they would oscillate always following the food. Um, so yeah, and this is nice because this is, this is, uh, this is, a, this is a very similar pattern to what we see in, like, in, in, in predator-prey cycles, you know, the standard lock of Volterra thing. So, also nice. And this is, again, like we didn't program any of this. Like we simply just designed a simple world with food and neural nets and said go. And we get all this, just, it just comes right out. So. Okay, so, so, now, so now we're going to look at the brains, because that's what we're really concerned about. So now, uh, the main thing to keep in mind here is really kind of the connection matrix. There's other stuff here, you know, scientists like that. So but anyway, so, this is, so, this, so this, is a, this is a random brain at the, start of the very beginning, at the very beginning of evolution. All the things are randomly wired together. And uh, so there we, there's one connection matrix. And this is one from the visual cortex of a cat. Um, now, and this is just, just a random slice of it. And now actually one from a poly, from a poly world critter after evolution. Ta-da. Now, the main thing to take away from this, um, it's not a cat, um, but it's certainly not random. And so basically you can see that, that evolution has gone from this to this, with doing nothing but just sitting there and letting CPU cycles turn on it. Um, so again, I'm not claiming that polyorganisms are cats, but I am saying that evolution is, do, is, is doing something very useful, and it's putting tons of structure in there um, that, 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 you, that you do not put in. So, all right. And, uh, and it, it, it kind of gets it's sort of inspiring, and you go, wow, maybe we actually could get a cat with this. So, there we go. So, so um, but now I'm going to show you some uh, more quantitative plots, more than just looking at pictures. Oh, sorry. So I always get this question a lot from philosophers in the room. They always say, oh, it's not alive. Well, okay, fortunately, uh, uh, the, there's a professor of mine that, that, that did a really good definition of life. It's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the farmer Baylin, um, uh, the Artificial Revolution, um, published from the Santa Fe Institute. And basically, uh, it says uh, it, it, ha it, it has these bits of criteria for turning something's alive. And, and, and uh, not so coincidentally, Polyworld was explicitly designed to satisfy all these criterions. Um, so in short, you have patterns space time, it does reproduce, it does have information storage, it does eat, and it has interaction with the environment, and it does evolve. So in short, um, to, that, to that, I have to say, well, it, it fits the, the definition of life that uh, most people use. So, so in your face. Um, okay, so then he'll say, but, it, but it, I'm not sure if it's intelligent. Well, that's a, sure. Which of those criteria does inspire me? Does it just last the ability to evolve? Just last? Hmm? Fire is a pattern in space time. It yeah, yeah. Itself, it has a self representation. Mm -hmm. It certainly has a metabolism and it has functional interactions with the environment. Right. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm saying it probably will satisfy all of these. Satisfies all oh, fire satisfies all of them. All of them. Um, does it, um, does it, 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 it doesn't have an issue with the uh, information storage. It doesn't have that. Well, if, you, if you have a coal left over from a fire, you can initiate another fire with it. Is that information? 
I, 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 I suspect, I mean, I don't really care if fire is alive or not. Fire probably can satisfy three or four of these. I mean, I'm not really attached. I, I don't, I'm indifferent to fire. Um, but uh, but, but I, I suspect if you, if, you did, if you looked at kind of the structure of coal or something, you probably wouldn't find, it probably, probably, um, probably wouldn't have much information there. I'm not sure exactly how you'd look at it, but I'm sure it's something you could do. But even if fire is alive, okay, sure, why not? Okay. But anyway, so people say, well, is it really intelligent? Because we just see them just moving around. Well, there's no real way to quantify intelligence, unfortunately. Um, and not even biologists can do this. Um, but however, because we're doing this all in simulation, means we, means we have access to a lot more things that biologists don't. And in short, we can use uh, information theory and complexity theory to try to analyze the critters' behaviors and their brains. And this is most of our research right now. So, um, so yeah, so we analyze their brains over time. Um, so, so here's a nice one. Uh, so uh, there are like three or four measures of neural complexity out there. And so far I've implemented two of them. Um, and, and they pretty much all kind of follow this pattern. Oh, sorry, for this kind of complexity, this is the, uh, the Tononi Sporns uh, complexity. I'll get you the paper on it. But, but in short, the, short, this metric of neural complexity, in short says, if all neurons fire independently, that's not complex. Uh, and so, if they, yeah. And if they all fire in unison, that's not complex either. So, so in short, you want this kind of middle ground between everything behaving randomly and everything behaving uniformly. And that's what, that's what, comple that's what neural complexity is. But in short, if you, look at, if you look at any of these, they pretty much all, um, they go up for a little bit, and then they kind of plateau. And uh, so you're like, hmm. Um, and, uh, and both metrics do that. Uh, so, well, that's what I got. Um, and, we, and right now we're trying to figure out how to make that go up more and trying to explain why it, why it plateaus. So I'll show you some other stuff now. Um, here, let's get that for a second. So, um, so now that we know that, so now we, now we know that neural complexity does indeed go up, we want to know if evolution is actually helping, this, helping the complexity go up or if it's just kind of going up accidentally. So there are two kind of views of the evolution of complexity. The first one is this one. This is a more natural one. And it says that, hey, you know, evolution actively favors more complex things. Move from bacteria, you know, just to big bacteria and then eventually to us. And, and evolution really wants that. And the other one kind of says, you know what, evolution really doesn't give a crap about complexity. Something just kind of increased increase by accident on complexity, and evolution doesn't really care. And the idea of this one is that, that, that if this is just mirrored, like, this, if, if things, this is just kind of diffuses outward, you know, on the spectrum of complexity, even if evolution doesn't care about it at all, you know, it'll, you'll eventually get complex things. And this is the idea you'd start with this and you get to that. And so this is evolution actively favoring complexity versus evolution not giving a rip. And this is, this is actually a debated question, and we can use polywell to answer this. Sure. I'm really concerned with the evolution of complexity in your system. But right. I think that it bears heavily, but it's fostered in such a very simple environment. Yes, I do. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. The question is whether or not um, the, 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 the complexity of organisms is predominantly a product of their environment. And the reason that we're not seeing a big increase in complexity is because the environment is so simple. And I think that's exactly it. So, and, and, I, and so we're, and we're actually looking, on the, looking at that now for ways, ways we can make the environment uh, more complicated to encourage more interactions and things like that. Um, but that, but that, that's, about, that's about four or five slides from now. So we'll get to it. Um, but yeah, so these are the two ones. This is kind of the experiment. And in short, here's, all, here's all what you see. So this, um, so, okay, so basically jury-rigged polyworld to make all matings random. So in short, like, even if you mate with someone, you don't actually get their genes. You get some random person's genes. It's sneaky. So, and this is the dashed line. So this is with evolution turned off. And, uh, oh sorry, this is complexity here, and this is time. And the uh, dark line here is with evolution on. Now initially this is very depressing, because you're like, oh, well with evolution turned off, you get higher complexity. You're like, well, you're doing nothing. Um, and this, and I was very sad when I first saw this graph. Um, but I always look at this thing here. This always appears. Like I've run this thing, oh, I don't know, like at least 10 times now. Um, and there's always this hump here. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and this is also a, a T test down here. We'll get that in a second. But in short, like the, the idea I came up with is that there's always this hump here. And, this, and the solution I came with was, well, um, evolution does favor an increase in complexity, but only up to a point. After you solve the world, we don't care if you're complicated anymore. And in fact, it actually costs you something to be complicated. And so as a result, we're going to kind of keep you roughly right there. While the diffusive one just kind of goes up on its own, it's completely, uh, it doesn't care about complexity at all, and it continues to go on up. Sure. Yeah, isn't, this, isn't that still a type of evolution, just where the fitness function is how long you survive instead of how much you make? Because if you randomly select a creature, mm -hmm. creatures who live a long time are going to be around more to get selected at random. So if you just survive a long time, 
and you're alive when other people are mating, then your genes will get passed on more. Um, let, let, let me think but about this. You do the, select, the, selection, the selection of the random genes from all the creatures who are alive at that time. That's my question. Yeah, I, I'm thinking. How was it done? I think it, was, I think it was from all the critters who were alive at that time. So the idea was, oh, no, I'm sorry. No, actually, no, I'm sorry. This is actually, the, that's, a very good, that's a very good question, but that was controlled for. So in short, I'll, well, I'll get into more detail. Basically, this was that we ran this, this, this black line first, and then, and then we said, okay, you know, um, uh, uh, and, then we, then we, and then we said, okay, like critter, critter one lived exactly this many time steps. Critter two lived exactly this number of time steps. So we did random, so we did random mating combined with uh, enforcing that, that each critter lived exactly the same amount of time. So, but, uh, but, but good, good question, clever. T equals 7,000, you're sort of proving out the dead code. Sorry, what does that mean? I don't, I don't understand. The complexity goes down because some of it is discovered to be unnecessary. Yes, 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 that I think, yes, correct. And that, and that basically fits, fits with, my, with my current belief. Um, I mean, I'm not exactly sure, sure uh, why, it, why it plateaus and why it gets, why it gets, uh, why it kind of stays there while the passive goes up. But I think, I think it's, I think it's pretty reasonable. So the idea is that, I mean, because you always see that. Like, I mean, complexity is useful at the beginning, but you don't want to be more complex than your environment makes you be. So, uh, so the idea is that we want to make the environment more complicated, and we'll see if that goes up more. Um, but yeah, that's, I agree exactly. Um, if you want to see this here, so this is, this is a t-test, basically seeing uh, to, to what extent, um, basically the, the degree of confidence to which uh, the dashed line and the solid line are thought to come from the same population. And basically, if it's above this critical here, uh, which basically says, um, yes, we're pretty sure they came from different populations. So we see that, oh, okay, right here, we're sure they came from different populations now. Um, but actually, right if it kind of crosses about right here, it, it just, it just kind of, it mostly kind of sits there. So, um, so, the, so, so there's some math to make us think that as well. Um, Okay, let's see what I got. So now, now I looked at neural complexity. I'll show you another one for genetic complexity. And this came from my professor at Caltech, Professor Adami. And, uh, and it's really nice. They actually correlate, they map over quite well. So this looks at the complexity of the genes. Um, so here, so actually, what is it? It was 7,000 when they crossed before? Yeah, about 7,000. Okay, let's go back to this one. Okay, 7,000, we see these are roughly similar. So, okay, so the way this one works, the dashed lines, again, are the, are the passive runs, and the solid lines are the, um, are the, are the with evolution turned on. And um, so, so, and we basically see that on the passive runs, the, the genetic complexity basically went down to crap, while on the, uh, on the active runs, the genetic complexity did not go to crap. In fact, it stays quite high. So roughly what this says, roughly what this, me what this measure looks for, it looks at the amount, uh, amount of disorder in, in, in the genome. So, so basically, if every gene was equally probable, or is, sorry, if every gene is equally present in, in, in the population, then, uh, then this goes down, then, then this goes to here. Um, but if there are some genes that are more favored than others, um, then, uh, th then, get, then this measure gets higher. Um, I can show you the equation for it, but that's roughly how it goes. Roughly it measures the amount of disorder in the population of genes. And roughly this says, okay, with evolution turned on, there is less disorder in the genes. So that's good and nice. And it's also convenient that we see the genetic complexity and the neural complexity being, being roughly correlated. Yes? When you say evolution is off, you're solely meaning that you've turned off the, the uh, sharing of genetic information yeah. from mating. Yeah. Everything else remains. Okay, when I say evolution is off, I say that the matings are random, and yeah, I basically the matings are random, and the critters are forced to live the same amount of time. So the idea, so, so there's controls, and then the matings are random. And so. The result is one, it is an exact copy of one of the parents. Okay, uh, when evolution is off, when, when, when well, when evolution is on, when two, when, when two creatures mate, their genes get, get, uh, get meshed together and they make a child. So, completely normal. When evolution is off, when two, when, when two, when two creatures mate, um, it, picks a completely, it picks two random genes from, from, from things currently alive. So, so, like it, so, it, so it probably, so, it, so um, and then it pops out that child. Why not just make a copy of one of the parents or something? I, I don't understand the, the motivation for getting a random gene from some other creature. Um, I, I, I have to think. may not be fixed. If it's completely random, it's random. I mean, I, I, I think the, I don't know, I'll have to, 
there, you, you may be able to do this if you just make, make, make a copy of one of, the, um, of one of the parents. You may be able to. I'll, I'll have to think about it. That's why that would work too. But, but, uh, but I know that, if, 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 that if, if, every, if every creature is equally favored, no matter what its genes are, evolution doesn't move. Like that, that's the rule. Like, like, like that, 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 has, that has selection with everything being equal, equally selected for. So uh, that, that's what motivated it. Sure? Random selection, random operators. Uh, if you have a finite population, uh, you will have a genetic difference, right? Yes. Uh, so and I think we should see here this, this up and down genetic drift due to finite but population I mean, after size. Some, time, some alleles will be lost in the population just because of the drift. So right. you will see the, there will be a dis there, there won't be this perfect mixing of all the possible alleles, but it will slowly go to a fixed point, right? Um, so the, the, well, you, you you certainly are right. That be, like I mean, uh, be, because of a finite population, you you will see, you you will see um, you will see variations in the pop, in, in the population, and I think this, this is what you're seeing here. So in this case, like this is still with completely random mating, and it's it's moving up and down a little bit, and I and this is this is due to drift. But as you increase the population size, this gets less and less and less, as exactly as you'd expect. So 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 yes, you're right, and and, and this and we're seeing it. So it's, so that's good. Okay. Oh, okay, we gotta be quick then. All right, so this is the next thing I'm gonna do real quick. I'm gonna press through this. So there's a real question of, so for this passive complexity, it could just be this passive complex, like why is this leveling out at all? So it could be that, um, that, that this is sort of, sort of an upper bound in the simulation, like the simulation can't support something, something of, of, of higher neural complexity. Well, well we, so we jury rig poly world to say, okay, we will sol we, we put into a, a fitness function mode. This is no longer natural selection. We will reward you solely for having a complex brain. And that's the red one here. So enjoy this says, hey, you know, the simulation can support much higher complexity if you, if you like really force it to do it. So, um, so in short, this basically says, hey, there, there's room to grow for, uh, for, for evolution. So, all right. So basically if we have, so the next parents will be making a more complex environment and trying to move, move these curves closer up to the red. Um, so okay, that's the thing to draw from there. So these are the future directions we're taking Polyworld into, but predominantly making the world a more, co more complex and then coming up with more measures of complexity for studying it. So in short, more measures of complexity. There's, there's, still, like, there's still four or five more that we haven't looked into yet. Um, a more complex environment. So like the first thing I, right now I want to add are like day and night cycles. So, I, so and this is, this is really easy to do because it's all in OpenGL and you could just tweak the ambient, the ambient lighting up and down. And the idea is that this would force them to, uh, to have sort of an internal clock saying, hey, it's dark now, I, I can't see anything, probably, probably shouldn't go foraging. Uh, and the idea is having like, different kinds of food types. So you can have different colors of food and, it, and, it, and one will give you more energy than the other. So you'll start having specialization. And the other is giving them uh, more, more, more senses. Right now they only see. And if you give them like smell or touch, the idea is that they could have uh, more interaction with the environment and that would be good. Um, yeah, so we've done the actual foraging. We did that very recently. Um, yeah, and we can also use this to answer questions about evolutionary theory as we did answer more questions about evolutionary theory uh, like than we did before. And then eventually we got to get up to classical, classical conditioning experiments. So this is kind of like, like the direction we want to go for the next few years. And if any of you have ideas, especially for the here, let me know. Or if you want to contribute code. So, um, so this is mostly it. Uh, the source code's available. You can get it now. Uh, it runs on Linux and Mac um, via Qt. It just works. Um, and there you can download it. Um, yeah. And uh, then at the very end, I always get the question is, oh, you're making Frankenstein. This is a terrible idea. And I, I always like this slide to respond to them. So. And uh, yeah, I have no problem with that responsibility. If 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 the if if the, if, the, if they kill if the if if the polygons kill us all, well, oh well, it happens. <laughs> okay, and uh, I'm done. Questions. Oh wait, got to turn this thing off. Uh, so just an idea about directions for to test theories in evolution. Have you thought of uh, sex selection uh, to see if there's specialization between giving very little or a lot of contribution to the offspring and see if they're too niches, two genders develop? Um, well, currently there is no gender. Um, the, uh, you, you could certainly do it. Um, my, right now, the main reason no gender right now is because we didn't want to cut, cut the population, like the mating pool in half. Um, so like right now these critters currently run with, there's about, there's about 300 agents in a simulation. Well, actually, well, sorry, I'll back up. The answer is yes, you could do that. That'd be really, that'd be really cool. 
Um, but right now we don't do it because we are concerned about uh, it might could be hard to find a mate. Oh, but I mean, aren't there some, I mean, I'm very ignorant of this, but aren't there some theories which say that the origin of the division of genders is that there, there was a specialization in two niches, right? One, mm -hmm. The males contribute very little. They tried to mate a lot. The females contribute a lot more. And so maybe you could look for if these two niches develop, even in the absence of explicit gender. I don't know. If that was just an idea. Um, you could certainly, well, it's certainly possible, like if you had two different kinds of behaviors, and one was favorable one time, some was favorable at other times, um, you, you, you could get that to come out naturally. But, um, but, but when they can always mate sort of all the time, um, it's, 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 it's going to be tricky for, uh, for, that, for, that to, for that to be enforced over the long term. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's certainly possible. And, and if you want to do, if you want to do, do gender differences, it'd actually be really neat. I mean, if you just started enforcing it, see, what, see if they were, uh, s s if they were started, started, like, started using each other, things like that. So that'd be, that'd be cool. Sure. What strikes me about these networks is, uh, these networks, um, at least as, as I took it to mean, don't have uh, any state, they're not recursive networks? Uh, no, they are recurrent they are, networks, so they, okay. they can connect back if they want. We actually have a new, new kind of, um, these recurrent is summing and squashing neurons. We have a brand new model that has spiking neurons, and it's, it's, it's pretty, I don't, I don't know much about it yet. Well, I haven't used it much yet, but we do have more fancier models. And they do, they do save state in between cycles? And like um, let's see, well, the, no, we don't save state between, between cycles, but, but we do update their vision. Right, right. Okay, I mean, right. That, that seems to me to be necessary in order to maintain a mental model of, of where you are in the world as opposed to just a single state. Mm -hmm. Here I am, what's, what am I going to do? It seems like that's a... That, that, that's a fundamental part. Right. Yeah. Um, let's see. I don't think we're saving, we're saving the state of, of, of the network uh, from one time to the next, like the, of the internal nodes. Um, I will, I'd have to think of... Okay. Well, I, I can answer the question empirically in like, in like 10 minutes of going through the code. So, okay, so I'll, I'll answer it in a little bit. I think this is a really good and uh, interesting presentation, but um, I, I guess I have a little difficulty because I'm not that familiar with the area to, to have some context for it. C could you say just a few words, words about Sugar World and Tierra and neural Darwinism so I have some sense of how oh, this Oh, um, yeah, I, I've heard of Sugar World, but I haven't, um, but the only thing I, I, I have never, I've heard of Sugar World. Um, I know that in Tom Ray's, oh, sorry, I should back up. So, so there's some previous simulations. Uh, Tom Ray's Tierra was basically, uh, was the first thing of, 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 um, of evolving code. And, uh, and it was, and it was like, and it was, it was really awesome. Um, but there, there were a few problems with it is that basically things always, always got smaller and smaller and smaller. So, um, so that was kind of a problem in, in Tom Ray's Tierra. So, like, like, it always became better if, if, your, if, your, um, if your genome got smaller because that way you could reproduce faster because they were, uh, because they were penalized. For, like, they were only getting a certain number of cycles to reproduce themselves, and if you're very small, you can reproduce, reproduce yourself a lot. Um, I don't actually know if, as far as I know, Tira has not been extended to, to account for these original defects, um, but, but, um, but certainly Tira is, like, really great. Um, as far as sugar, sugar escape, um, I've heard of it. I don't know much about it. Um, so, but if you see me a paper on it, I'll certainly read it, and I'll give you a commentary then. Um, sorry, what was the other one you want? Oh, neural Darwinism. Okay, so neural Darwinism is, uh, is a theory of neuroscience, and it's probably even true. Um, in short, it says that the way uh, connections are formed in the brain is kind of like evolution. It's not exactly. But roughly it says that uh, neurons initially connect to a whole bunch of things, and most of them suck. And, and the ones that suck get pruned and they go away. So, so, so roughly neural Darwinism is like, like, like expand, prune, expand, prune. And, um, and it says that this is how connectivity in the brain um, comes about. Um, and it's probably true. Sure, just who, well, whoever. Whoever's close to the microphone in the, here. Uh, so on your final slide, I think it was the final slide, uh, you said that one of your goals is to make the environment more complex. Yes. And experiment with more features, I guess, and so on. Uh, so I think it's little, it may be a little bit of, of a problem because your current system is already very complex and mm -hmm. there are a thousand things that affect the way evolution goes in your current system and uh, you know, how you construct the production procedures and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, the fact that if you make the, the environment more complex, uh, you will be, possibly you will be able to see very fancy you know, uh, um, simulations, but you may, it may be even more difficult to understand why actually Evolution went this path and not, not the other way. You, 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 your bachelor's isn't in physics by any chance. I'm sorry? Your bachelor's isn't in physics by any chance? 
Just, I mean, like the physicists always say that, so I'm wondering what your background is. No, no, my background is actually, I studied evolutionary computation for my PhD. Oh, okay. All right. Well, yes. Okay. Well, so rough, the, the concern is roughly, well, if you make it more complex, you'll just have parameter hell. You already have parameter hell, but it could be even worse, like ninth layer parameter hell. Um, and the answer is yes, that, 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 that can happen. Um, and I guess, I guess the response is, well, uh, it, it seems like a lot of these things, things don't depend on the parameters very, very, very sensitively. So if we like vary a bunch of the parameters we have right now, you roughly see a lot of the same stuff. Um, and, the, and the hope is, is that if you choose just even remotely reasonable values, the good stuff will come out. And so um, so the, the, the point is valid. Um, and, but, but we don't think, but we think like the benefit of having a more complex world far exceeds the concerns of parameter hell. Hi. Hi. Hey, Crutcher. How you doing? Um, I've been thinking about this for a while. I mean, you showed it to me earlier today, but I've also been thinking about this general problem. And um, I think that we could state without being too contentious, that there are better strategies in the worlds that you're presenting. Like, if we were really careful and designed one, we could probably clean the clock of, of a number of these evolved systems. And I think part of that's going to be not a product of the structure of the brains, but the kind of inputs that they have available to them when they drive their behavior. Um, put another way, I don't think you should be adding complexity to your simulated world in terms of adding lighting effects or fog or other things like that. I think uh, there need to be more signals that have to do with kin selection and not, not just green, right? Like I, in the natural world, even at the, the very cellular level, you, just as a natural byproduct of the way evolution is going to affect what kind of presentation you throw up on your cell uh, walls, like you can do kin selection in the environment pretty okay. easily. Like that's, that's assumed. Um, and so you can, a lot of the complexity that we see in natural systems and how social systems interact and how predation systems interact seem to be driven by really complicated gradients that end up working out down the, the kin similarity. Like I don't want to mate with someone who's exactly like me and I don't want to mate with someone who's really, really different from me either because if I mate with someone who's exactly like me, it's not worth the energy because there's not going to be very much variation. If I mate with someone who's too different, the child's not going to be viable. And like the complexity in your environment should flow out of the behavior of the features that you're competing with. And you should see speciation resulting um, from preferences um, and alternate uh, patterns. And like that it doesn't seem like there's enough input available for the neural networks that you're evolving, which seem to be really cool, mm -hmm. to exploit that gradient. So I think maybe finding some way to allow them to sense the presence of, and go ahead and cheat, you know, like look, look aside, do similarity scores, and provide like a sense that's a similarity sense, you know, it, not based on light at all. I mean, you're looking directly at the genes. Because in any natural evolving system, you'd end up having pheromones and various other markers that you would learn to exploit. Um, but they don't really have that. All they have is what they present directly. Um, and it would take a very, very long time for that to evolve. I think I get your, so your, your point seems to be roughly that the critters should have more complex interactions with each other rather than more complex interactions with the environment. Well, is not that? even necessarily more, I mean, the. The actions that they can take are fine. I just don't think that they can observe the other critters well enough. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, so I guess the answer is I agree. And and if and if someone wants to write it, if you want to write it, I'll, I would I would gladly put the patch in. Um, so uh, now as to whether that would be that, as to whether or not more complexity between well, more, more complexity between critters would be more valuable uh, than interaction with the environment. I guess I guess you could try it and find out. I mean I think both would be great. So, 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 yeah, so there's, there's, there's no contention. Okay. All right, let's take one more question in Mountain View, and then we'll let the videotapers go, unless there's a, a remote office that had a question that I wasn't fair to. Yeah, so um, as a biological creature myself, I kind of hope that uh, death is not inevitable, 
And uh, I was curious what you were noticing in your simulations if you turned off uh, the, the, the limited lifespan uh, of a creature. Oh. Um, let's see. Um, I guess you could just clamp it. You could do that. I know the reason I did that is, is, is just because like, I, saw, I saw a paper at a conference that, that, that just had these mating populations, and it said, said that, um, that having a, a fixed lifespan, or at least a max lifespan, was a good thing. So I said, oh, well, just put in a gene. Done. So, um, so, so I have ne I've never actually clamped it and compared the differences. Um, but you can certainly do it. I mean, I mean there's, there's just a parameter. So, yeah, so, so what I'm thinking is that if, if you didn't have a limited lifespan, mm -hmm. what would you, the results of your, of your simulations be? That's what I'm curious well, about. Well, most critters don't get to their max lifespan. Most of them die of energy. So, um, so, so in this case, like, I think like, the average critter lifespan is some, like 300, 400 time steps, and the maximum lifespan is something like um, 700, 800, something like that. So, so, so most, so very, very few get killed by that. Um, so, I, so I guess I don't think the maximum lifespan has much impact on it. And I just put it in there because I saw a paper that said this was good. So, and it was, and I was writing that piece of code at the time. So. Um, okay, we'll still be around after, after the talk is over if anyone wants to chat more. All right. Thank you. <laughs>